Welcome to Geopods. On the second episode of discussing American politics, it is me, Vaibhav Singh, who has interest in American geopolitics and American policy decisions along with maritime de- decisions. And with me, I have today Har Suri, who is the co-founder of the Geostrata and also has a keen interest in American politics. So, Harsh, what has been what has been the following up in the news? Like, I know you are really interested in American politics. What all has been happening? Any key insights from your side? Thank you so much, Weber, for uh, you know giving me this platform to discuss this. Uh, I remember that you and me we came up uh, last night and we said that we have to come up with something on this issue. And uh, right now, as I am following, uh, we are on to two primaries now. Uh, we have had Iowa caucus and we have had uh, the you know New Hampshire primary. And as of now, Trump leads it with heavy margin and uh, he's looking very strong in South Carolina, which is the home state of Nikki Haley, where she was the governor. So uh, we need to look at how she performs there. But right now, if you ask me, I think it's already a done deal. I think Trump is going to be the nominee. There's no way Nikki Haley can get past Super Tuesday. If she gets past uh, South Carolina, fine, it's her home state, but there's no way she can get over, she can roll over Trump in Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is the place when the entire Republican establishment after Trump wins, it comes back to him and saying, he, yes, this is this is our guy. It's back like that, uh, 2016 and 2020, everyone is going to get behind him. So that's the nomination part of it. Uh, apart from that, I I think that I am starting to look beyond the nomination, like what what will happen during the rematch. And that is something that I also want to discuss with you. Like, what do you think is going to happen after the nomination? Like, we are going to have a rematch. We are going to have three presidential debates, most probably. What do you think will happen after the nomination? What's your take on that? I think, uh, like, as you said, even for me, it is a battle which is already decided as far as the Republican primaries are concerned. Uh, I am 99% sure that Trump is going to be the Republican candidate and Biden is going to end up with the uh, Democratic candidate, of course. Uh, As far as what do I think the general elections and the debates and all those, uh, all the polling season, all the election season would be in the US, I think it would remain... Uh, very similar to the previous one at least like I expect those heated debates I accept like classic Trump things going making remarks snacky remarks rhetorics even Biden following up with a lot of those because even in the last one although I expected Biden not to be really great with his rhetorics and debates but even if you go through the previous debates he has been really clear with his words and what he wanted for the United States but I think that personally what has happened uh, even if you would go to the Republican primaries and the general approval ratings from Biden, the American public has some, like they have lost some amount of interest in what Biden was trying to sell them. Uh, the new education schemes, the rollouts, the bailouts he was promising, there are some of them which he still has to deliver. And in fact, the administration is still in a fight to get the education bailout for the loans, which is which they expect to be rolling out in maybe the next few months, but they still not have, have been delivered. So I think Biden has not delivered on a key on the key promises, and especially a lot of like it has been an unlucky uh, ruling from him for him as well. Yes. Except increasingly seen a lot of conflicts around the world. Like exactly. but, Whenever Biden was coming into power, I'm sure he did not want Russia to go into war with Ukraine. And he did not even have the Israel-Palestine war into his mandate when he was coming in. So that has been the two major things. Uh, Apart from that, as far as the Trump camp is set, I think he's uh, much better prepared. I think he's much better set on, okay, these are the specific things I want to fight on and these are the specific things I want to protect. It'll be much better uh, to go against Biden than to protect the house which was in the last elections at least according to me a lot of political scientists might differ on it but I think he has a better chance this time 
but let's see what happens. That has been the US politics. You never know in the next three or four months what happens up. And we we can't we cannot forget the number of federal charges he still have has yes. on his back. Yeah. So that is a major thing. Would like what is your assessment? Like, how do you see the Trump campaign shaping up this year? Like, how different it will it'll be from the last campaign which happened? Yeah, there are many important points that you picked up on Weber. And, uh, you know, before getting to the question that you asked me, I would like to add a few of the things that you also mentioned. Uh, you know, there is this one legacy that Trump has, the lasting legacy of the way he shaped the district courts of America, the way he shaped the Ninth Circuit, the way he shaped the Supreme Court with a proper conservative majority on the Ninth Bench Supreme Court which turned down his student loan initiative of Biden, right? And uh, also the Roe v. Wade, who can forget that? So the thing is, even when Trump is not in power, his legacy remains. Like, what he has done will have a lasting legacy for 30, 40 years. He has kept very young, uh, you know, Supreme Court justices mm -hmm. uh, to the power. So that is going to, that is hammering Biden like anything. I see them going against the environmental authorities. I see the Supreme Court going against, you know, this extra mandate that these authorities have. So while Biden has been talking too much with Bidenomics that we will do this, we will do infrastructure, we have a bipartisan bill and everything. Uh, while CHIPS Act has something on the ground, there are many other things which are more socialist in nature, more uh, which have a more social character to them like student loans and different things they are not really having effect on the ground because of the way trump shaped the supreme court and shaped the ninth district of the courts so that is one thing it has been tough for the administration yes yeah yeah exactly it has been very tough uh rightly pointed that out moving on from that trump is better placed this time and uh you know from the uh, things that I have been uh, reading up at the experts that I have been talking to or reading about the friends that I have in uh, policy circles and everywhere uh, have been telling me that this time, uh, while Trump is not that aggressive, he has set up his priorities right. That what am I going to look at? He is not going that hard on, uh, or, or that, uh, hard on you know, uh, abortion. He's not uh, taking a very Republican stance on abortion because he know what happened to Republicans right after, uh, you know, uh, the decision for abortion came in 2022 when uh, we came up with this huge uh, governical uh, elections, uh, governational uh, elections, governor elections, and then also house elections. There was uh, a sense that there would be a Republican wave, but nothing like that happened. There was no red wave. And mainly it was driven on the fact of abortion. Abortion is a very big thing now because, you know, the suburban women, they are coming out. They're coming out, they're speaking through their vote. And there are many other uh, states which are not that uh, blue, which are red states. Voting, uh, you know, uh, showing that they have a dedicated approach when it comes to abortion. They are not pro-life as such. You know, many conservatives coming up, many independents coming up. That is the biggest fear. I think this time Trump is better placed, but he will be more better placed if he has a, a female VP, which can resonate. So Nikki Haley is one, but I, I don't think he will opt for her. But if he's smart enough, he should. Because that will cover a lot of things for him. Uh, so that that is one. Apart from that, the things that I'm looking at is this time, one thing where Trump is very weak is that he doesn't have a very good and dedicated team. As per what I have seen, he has kept his circle very close after 2020. Now he keeps more people like those who are yes to him. Like, yes, man. Like, whatever you say is right. Uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani, uh, when he was with him, he was a yes man that yes, Michael Flynn, all these people, uh, Steve Bannon. Now the team is even more conservative, even more right wing. So the thing is, we have to see, will he get more smart people enough 
while we move towards the election in September and when we come near the October surprise? Will he have more smart people being in his administration if he really wins? Right now, he's. I think some uh, polls are showing him one point lead, five point lead near the margin of error. Yeah. But but the thing is, he needs to get those smart people if he really wants to. But one thing I want to ask you, Webhav, keeping aside if Trump wins or Biden wins, this election is going to tell the character of America. Like, what is the character of America? And how much should we, you know, as a world, really depend on this power? Because some six, seven swing states are going to decide the future of geopolitics. At the end, yeah. That's, yeah, so that's what's going to happen. Is the world so fragile that in the end, these six, seven states, Pennsylvania, uh, now even Georgia, is it was a red state. Now it's also a swing state. Arizona, Nevada. Uh, you know, are these people going to decide, Wisconsin, are they going to decide that where we are going to go in terms of geopolitics? Because in the end, these are the states who are going to keep it. So what do you think about that? I think, uh, like, speaking up on the lot of things you mentioned, although I think keeping Nikki Haley as a VP candidate with him is a brilliant idea. It turns out as that one of those yin and yang situations balancing each other out because I think collectively both of them represent the whole will of the Republican Party where some might in the Republican Party might say that they don't resonate with Trump, they don't resonate with his ideas of doing things a certain way and they might support Nikki Haley. Like we have seen that even she's getting like a decent amount of delegates when it comes to the primaries. I think getting them both collectively is, and they can even like pull some Dems, some blue states if they both come together. I think that is that is something which can happen. It is one of those smart decisions, but the thing is that will Trump risk it? I think because for Trump, he wants, like, as you said, he wants a very dedicated, a very loyal team. And I don't think Nikki Haley poses as one of those because she has been very open and very vocal about what she thinks about Mr. Yes. Trump. And as far as the, like, American politics, I think nothing better explains American politics in the past five or ten years than McCarthy taking 15 rounds of vote to being elected as a exactly, speaker of the exactly. House. I think that is what the whole mood of the United States is. It is highly divisive now. It is highly, like, you know, you have no idea what way it will swing next year, next month, or even in the next week. It has been very tough. Like, and as likely as we said, even when Biden came into power three months into it, four months into it, he lo lost the House of Representatives to the Reds. So I think even when Trump left, and I agree to that. He he has left a very, some might say it is scarring, but I would say it is a very deep impact on the whole American politics. Whether, whether it is the Supreme Court, whether it is the House of Representatives or even the Senate. I think that will remain. And even in whenever the, if we expect or if we vision the Republicans to win, I think even that the divisiveness in the parliaments or in the House of the uh, representative remains because I, it has been very tough historically in the u.s to control all uh, all three uh, parts of your government if you yeah. have the white house it is very tough for you to control both the senate and the house of representatives although as far as on the ground politics has remained i think this has been a year where the dems are a bit worried because we saw a lot of veteran leaders from the democrats retiring and announcing that they won't be running a campaign. I think one of the best example was like the Joe Manchin guy. I think that is like he was a big go vote getter for the Democrats in his state in like West Virginia state, which has like a lot of reds, but he still used to get uh, a blue like he at the end of the day, like a lot of conservatives on that state, but he still used to get a seat from that uh, for the Democrats. So I think a lot of these states will matter. As far even as Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, retiring. even Nancy Pelosi is retiring. Uh, although I have like, mo most people have very contrasting opinions on that lady, even uh, like, uh -huh. af uh, especially after the stock market issues and all those things. And uh, her visiting Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, her visiting Taiwan was a good move. Um, I think what remains no matter who wins the elections or who gets the tickets to the generals, I think the era of uneasiness for the American public 
and for the American Union or the American uh, structure remains because that has been something which has been there since 2019, 2020, uh, after the first election and after the whole uh, people getting into the Congress and all that stuff. I think that'll remain. It has last, like the first Trump term has lasted, has has had an effect on US that will resonate at least for the next 15 and 20, to 20 years in the US politics. Mm -hmm. I think I think most of the people will agree on with me on this. So <clears throat> as far as that remains, I think we are in a period of joyride, uh, a period in joyride for the US, like at least sitting in India, we can observe what happens in a developed democracy after it reaches a certain point. Because it is one of those philosophical cases that no matter how much order you might have at the end of, at the end of the day, you're going to have chaos. So it is one for the books, uh, how the US politics was running so smooth, so clean for so many years. And now suddenly they look like a third world state when it comes to their elections or when it comes to the results after the elections, especially in Donald Trump's case. So I think that will remain. Uh, my... Uh, like the way I want this conversation to go after this is like, what do you think? Like Biden obviously would have a game plan, right? Because he knows that even last time the margin was not that big. He could have easily lost that election. He could have easily won by even more states. So what do you think? Like, what do you think the Democrats are able, like what positions do you think they're able to give up on? What are the some positions that they might say, Ki, okay, this is a position which was controversial last time. So maybe we're not gonna approach this. Like, do you think it is gun control? Do you think it is the whole pro-life or uh, like pro-life or anti-life stance? What, what do you think it is? I think when it comes to, uh, you know, these, positions that Democrats will take or drop. I think gun control, they took it heavily uh, with Kamala Harris being on back of it. Uh, but now I see that there is not much. Uh, I saw recently also there were some uh, shootings, not mass shootings, but no, uh, basic normal American shootings in a county uh, going on. So sad that this is something very funny uh, because Americans are not able to get through it because of the way that NRA has its power and lobby in the entire Washington establishment. So I think they, they uh, the Dems have kind of dropped the uh, talk of, you know, gun control uh, for now. Uh, but it's just one mass shooting away. You have one mass shooting and then again, all that will come back to the fore. But for now, I think the Democrats have dropped it and they have their fingers crossed that they don't want any mass shootings. It's just that they dropped it because... They don't want the NRAs, uh, you know, to get back on that, that no uh, pouring in money into Republican elections for getting uh, the Trump administration and Trump people elected. That is one. The second thing is, I think they're going to push very hard on abortion because that is something that if in 2024 Biden comes back, it will have uh, it, the reason of abortion will be one of the biggest. Uh, because uh, in the end, this matters a lot to independents, if not to Republicans, uh, in terms of what the decision has to be. Independents are very clear about it. So uh, this is one thing. The other thing here is that uh, I think the uh, Israel-Palestine issue, uh, the Dems are ignoring it. But I don't think so. It will have that big of a uh, implication when it comes to the election. Because this is more of an online narrative. When it comes to on-ground uh, people who are going to vote, not many of the people who are bringing online narrative, most of them are Indians only these days. I don't think so. They, uh, they, no one is there to vote, right? But there, are, there is a sizable chunk that is moving, uh, you know, college-educated uh, uh, white people or college-educated black people who are moving towards Trump. That is something new, you know, uh, young people moving towards Trump. But that is not only because of Israel-Palestine. That is a very less uh, part of it. That's more because of wars happening, inflation going up. American economy is doing good right now. But what is not doing good right now is the prices. The prices of gas, the prices of electricity, the prices of daily, uh, daily food items. Those are the things that are taxing Americans. 
I saw, uh, you know, many uh, town halls that CNN did and uh, others did, uh, where they, many uh, voters were talking about how, you know, how will the next administration benefit their pocket? Because in the end, it is the economy stupid. That is what the Americans say, right? One economy plays a very big role. So the Dems will have to take up, uh, you know, charts on that will they really deliver on the social areas that they talked about in 2020. That is one. And will they be able to uh, bring down uh, inflation? Biden should cross his hands that by the time uh, October, uh, November is coming, world doesn't get into one more conflict. One more conflict and no matter what, I don't think so, then there's any way he's winning. Because the thing is, there's, there's this image attached to Trump that when he is there, wars don't happen. Because the thing is, uh, he doesn't want to get attached to the wars, right? And he's also, uh, right now, but, but the NATO people are keeping their fingers crossed that what happens if he comes back. They are also pl planning contingencies for it. So that is what they, uh, the US uh, Congress even passed an uh, act that no one can leave NATO, a president cannot leave NATO directly. So this shows the fear, right? So when it comes to Democrats taking up things, I think abortion is take. It's a tick. Uh, I think gun control is a cross. They shouldn't touch that. Israel-Palestine is a ignore for them. They are ignoring, is, uh, ignoring it as much as they can. And now I see that the war mainly in the American mindset going down. You know, Americans move forward much faster than anyone else. Uh, then uh, the, uh, apart from that, uh, the thing is that uh, for now, economics is a part where Biden is lagging a lot. So we need to see that should Biden keep on carrying his Bidenomics ahead. I think infrastructure is something that they should keep on taking up. Uh, Chips Act is something that they should, uh, you know, keep their uh, things up on. And there is this thing that the Democrats are not that hard on China when it comes to narrative. So that is also one thing that they need to, uh, you know, make sure of. Rather than only Russia bashing, they need to look at China also a bit. Because if they do that, then that can also focus on voters that are more conservative or independents uh, leaning towards, uh, you know, the Republicans. So that is also one thing. So we need to, uh, we need to see what all they take, what all they drop. But these are the things. Rest, the biggest take that they are taking is that this is all about democracy in 2020. If Trump is back, then that will be a problem. So that is it. Apart from that, uh, like, what do you think are the Republican takes? One, we know that, uh, you know, they are working a lot on the southern border. And I think the Democrats are also now, now not touching the southern border in terms of, you know, ignoring border control. They, they are not ignoring border control that much. They're trying to talk about it. They are seeing that this is now getting out of hand. So I think I think all the kudos goes to the Texas Texas governor. Like yeah. that guy has been so brilliant in reminding the Democrats that immigration and migrants, illegal migrants, is one of the biggest issues in the United States. And the Democrats have been ignoring it like one of those issues. Like they have been very convenient. They have they, they seem it, it is pretty easy that if the migrants are coming to Texas, it is their deal because for large in the United States history, uh, they, it has been like that. It is the state's mandate. The state deals with all the illegal migrants coming in. They give them shelters. They even look after their asylum applications. I think the brilliant decision of the Texas governor to load them up into a bus and send up to the uh, north uh, eastern territories to one of those posh uh, blue states where they think that uh, we have to be very good our, with our migrants but we won't handle any in our state i think that has like changed a lot of things inside the us we have seen the new york mayor coming out saying how they can't accept more migrants they do they simply can't pay for it without cutting out from the school expenses or the police or the fire station so i think my migrants illegal migrants will be one of the biggest takes for Donald Trump. I think he can even fight his whole campaign on that. Because as you said, the American public doesn't seem too much interested by either of the wars, whether it is the Israel-Palestine issue or whether it is the issue with the Russian-Ukrainian border. As far as the 
about abortion thing is concerned i think the conservatives have been done a tough deal at least by the social media on this because historically if you would read the conservative stand on this and since i have done a bit of research into the pro life and uh, pro choice debate what the conservatives simply wanted or the republicans simply wanted was a return of the status quo they were not pro life or they were no not pro choice as such the evangelists inside the conservative party or the republican party might be but the republicans have been very clear that for all they wanted was a status quo to reach to like set to be set behind the roe v wade decision and it, then it is for the states to decide so i think a lot of narrative that has been done by the democrats there has been really good like i have to give it to them they have played it really well even though the decision was one of the most pivotal one and even it was not uh like like it was something which the republicans were wanting and something they were uh, actually vying for but the way it was stuck down and way it has been publicized into the public or into the masses it has been very good for the dems as far as the other issues concerned like i would love to have your opinion on this and this is one of the most important questions in in my mind like when we saw trump uh leave the white house or the oval office the world was in a totally different place there was no russian invasion of ukraine there was no israel palestine issue in in fact they were able they were almost on the verge of brokering a historic peace deal there yeah. there was a embassy coming up in jerusalem saudi was having better than ever relations with the israeli government we had like even the china deal was like like he was very practical on his approach to china <laughs> yeah award in fairy tale and now that he comes back it is a totally different condition it's so a mess. it's a mess and he can't simply ignore it in his uh, campaign for this year so what do you think like what is he proposing he can't just go back to okay i'll broker peace between israel and palestine again because i don't think it is the same easy way at least for the next not for the next 3 years 2 years as long as the con- as the conflict goes on like what do you think his gameplay would be what do you how do you vision the american geopolitics for the next 5 years if trump wins globally like how does how, what changes what doesn't changes and what increases or what decreases see the question that you have asked is very pivotal and it's very pivotal for india also assuming if trump wins it's going to be good for india because uh, it has always been good when republicans have been in power for at least it has always been good it has always been pro india but a trump leading an american uh, you know american state which is right now in a position where there are two wars going on rather than when trump left he uh, he removed american army from afghanistan almost brought it to nil then biden did that defacable uh, you know uh, removal in 2021 and uh, moving on to uh, you know uh, trump getting people out from syria uh getting the us troops out from there we will have to see how does he handle wars you know because there are two wars going on with enormous amount of american involvement in them israel an outpost of america as per many people in uh, west asia and then uh, U- ukraine uh, an american nato outpost for russia i think when it comes to ukraine he, he may not be able to you know fight the deep state in terms of crushing the uh, you know uh, the funding and aids to ukraine that that is not going to happen at all they are going to keep on doing that and i think there are many republicans also i uh, saw lindsey graham lindsey graham said that you know this is the best money that we have ever spent because they have brought russian army to the second most powerful army to ukraine army when it comes there so i think when it comes to this the republicans are the most heavy spenders on military so and you know when he comes to the power when he sits back in oval office all this rhetoric will go because he loves to be you know that person who's around wars taking decisions sending arms sending ammunitions and let me tell you trump was the first person first president 
to send real lethal arms to Ukraine. He was the first person to do that. So the thing is, he he is going to be in the limelight. He will love it that you know I am giving them these tanks, these F 16s if they do. He will, I think, surely if he likes it, he will do it. But then also, how much is he compromised vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Because then there are many things of that uh, case also. So it's about Ukraine. I don't think so that he's going to cut off the war. It will only depend if the entire Western will is crumbling, which it is. You know, uh, Europeans are also now seeing that until when are we going to fight this war? Because these advanced democracies, they don't want to fight all these wars and all. They don't want to be indulgent. They want to do economical stuff and raise up the standards of their uh, lives. Moving on to uh, West Asia, Middle East, it is a place where uh, they will have to look that if it serves the American interest to, you know, uh, to let the war going on. I think that is where Trump will have his cards the most because Netanyahu also uh, is a person who has a good amount of repo with Trump. And Trump has a good amount of following in uh, Israel. So I think it will be that he will be able to use that stuff. You know, uh, he has Jewish people in his family only. Kushner is one. And I think he will use, uh, you know, all his power to at least broker something there. Because Abraham Accords is his legacy. I don't think so. He will uh, like to, uh, you know, get that all in tatters. So I will think that is a place where he will try to deal. Ukraine is a place where I don't think so much can be done. Because it involves a great power. It involves Russia. And America's aim has been to crumble Russia in total terms. So, uh, and then when it comes to uh, China and all, I think there the rhetoric will be uh, again to, you know, bash China up, block things, block economic, uh, you know, uh, connections and then do decoupling. So that is now, uh, moving on from that, I, I would like to, you know, get your concluding remarks on this talk because if we keep on going, then we will be going on and on and on. Who, who we can talk to, for hours for sure on this. Yeah, who wants to stop when it comes to US politics and geopolitics. Uh, but yeah, what do you think is the way forward for now? For now, what do you think? We imagined a scenario of Trump uh, being in power. We will have more uh, questions like these in upcoming episodes of Geopods. But what do you think right now in this current situation is happening in US politics and where are we going exactly? I think the answer remains same. I think in the next five to six months, we'll like in the next two or three months, we'll know where the primaries are going. I don't think Nikki Haley is going to stay for long in this. Although even before the New Hampshire results, she announced that even she, if she loses New Hampshire, she'll stay in the race. But we haven't had much news from her campaign even after she lost those. Uh, as far as the Republican primaries are set, as I said, as long as the courts in the US or the federal rulings do not interrupt Mr. Donald J. Trump, I can see him as a clear Republican candidate for these general elections. And weighing out the policies that the Democrats and Republicans have to present to the American people and also following the American politics and the American people for the past three or four years under Biden, I think what matters to them is their how set is their own house. I don't think at, at this point of time they're interested in Russia. I don't think at this point of time they're interested in Gaza or Israel, although China might be, China is one of those issues which has touched a lot of people in US. Like they always have China in their subconscious, even like any major decision and they always think, okay, what are we doing to counter China? So that is one of those uh, pivotal things. I think the whole long round process, whatever the CIA or whatever the deep state has for the US for decoupling with China, I think that will remain because we have seen with us policies like even if the regime changes most of them remain same when it comes to maintaining the whole global superpower tag because that is something which the us would never let go of even they don't care which president comes in they don't care what vp comes in for them the most important is the american interest and i think the american interest right now 
is primarily lies in two things. One of them is setting the house in order, whether it is within the communities, whether it is the whole economics point of it, the whole inflation point of it. And I think the second most issue, second most important issue, I think it is clearly China. I think that is the only foreign issue which matters to the American waters. And like in conclusion, I think, as I said, we are moving into uh, those eras of unsettling democracies. Like people, if Trump comes in or whether if Biden comes in, we have seen less and less bipartisanship. We have seen more and more division between ideologies. And I think that will remain. So like that was my concluding remarks. Anything you have to say and then we can end, end this episode of the Geopods and like promise our viewers that they will come back again. Maybe next time with the imagination of what happens if Biden comes into power and what happens if Trump goes into jail or something like that. I think we can talk on it for like hours and hours. Yeah, my concluding remarks will also be same as yours. Uh, but just adding to those, I think uh, it's it's fun to see that a developed democracy which used to lecture everyone on how to be a good democracy is right now in a place where, you know, it is seeing that this election matters so much that would they survive or not in terms of being a democracy. But my remarks on that is I think Americans and the, the left and the center and the liberal media is hyping it up too much. I think the vitals of American democracy are too strong to be, you know, sh to be shook by just one election. I don't think so that's going to ever happen. The military is dedicated to the constitution. The entire uh, Supreme Court is there. They are not never going to let anything like this happen. I think it, when push comes to shove, the Americans are not going to let their democracy and open society go anywhere. So I don't, I think whatever the election result is going to be, the American democracy will persist. There's nothing that can shake it as of now. You can say that, you know, many people are saying that you should not avoid, uh, you know, things and uh, things like uh, which show that means something is coming up in future. That doesn't apply to American democracy. It's too strong. There are too, too, che uh, too big check silences to do that. So, yeah, uh, there are many things. Uh, let's see what happens. And uh, that will be all from my side. Web up. Yeah, you. thank you for that, Ash. And at the end, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Donald J. Trump for being yeah. the only former president to have federal uh, notices against him. Uh, <laughs> he has done something very beautiful in the U U.S. history. And I think with those good words and congratulations to Mr. Trump, we'll end this episode of the Geopods. This has been the episode second for the US geopolitics and policies. And thank you, Ash, for joining me today. Thank you, Ebo. Bye-bye.